good evening good evening dignitaries friends from the media ladies and gentlemen i am vishal gupta chairperson of the ashang desai center for leadership and organization development at iim ahmedabad on behalf of the ashang desai center i welcome all of you to this power packed evening today i also welcome take this opportunity to welcome shri sunil kant munjal Mr Sanjay Nair Mr Siddharth Zarabi our director professor Errol D'Souza and Mr Devyesh Radia president AMA to this evening let me take this moment to introduce to you all the newly established Ashang Desai Center for Leadership and Organization Development at IIM Ahmedabad the center for leadership an organization development was inaugurated this year on J june 18th and is one of its kind center that has been established with a vision to create a platform for dialogue and discussion around various themes of leadership the center benefits from ima faculty members who come across from the diverse disciplines and are exploring various facets of leadership as well as organizational development the center is working researching consulting and training on the themes of impact leadership the session that we are going to witness today mental health and well being public sector leadership inclusion diversity and leadership for organization for knowledge led that is digital high tech are in the organizations we at the center aim to create a platform where faculty students and professionals from government non government and private organizations can come together to initiate a dialogue and co create distinctive and high quality leadership discourse in our country as part of our center's activities we have initiated the ima leadership lecture series with a plan to host individuals who have spent their lives experiencing demonstrating and researching various facets of leadership this lecture series is our marku initiative that aims to raise consciousness about the most critical subjects related to leadership and organization development and create deliberations that can lead to understanding of leadership organizational challenges that face our organizations our country and also to co-develop plausible solutions our hope and effort through this lecture series is to invite eminent individuals onto this platform so that they may share their knowledge and experiences with students faculty and professionals in ahmedabad gandhinagar region as well as around in the country as well as around the world we are extremely excited about this initiative and we hope that this would become a platform a source of ideas and insights to solve problems at least create dialogue about the problems that are being faced by leaders and management it is a pleasure and honor to have shri sunil kant munjal one of the founder promoters of the hero group india's premier automotive manufacturing group that has evolved from being the world's largest bicycle maker to the largest two wheeler maker as a guest this evening for the ima leadership lecture series so let me not come between the guests and the activities that have been planned and i would like to kick start or initiate the e evening's proceedings by inviting mr sanjay nair chairperson kkr india to talk about his experiences with the hero group and also set the context with uh, with his insights before that let me introduce mr sanjay nair to all of you mr sanjay nair joined kkr in 2009 and as a member and ceo of kkr india he is on the board of kkr's portfolio companies radiant healthcare bharti infratel magma financial services coffee day holdings 
and has had significant involvement with KKR's investment in Apollo hospitals. Prior to joining KKR's, Sanjay served as CEO of Citigroup's Indian and South Asian operations and was a member of Citigroup's management committee and Asia executive. He is currently a board of, member of the board of US-India Strategic Partnership Forum and SEBI's National Institute of Security, Securities Market Board of Governors. We could have none better to come and initiate this dialogue and set the context for this talk that we are going to witness. Mr. Nair. Thank you. I think you missed out the most important part of the introduction, which is that I am an alumni of I am Ahmedabad. <laughs> so I, and I know all this place, I know all the addas, I know all the secret markets, and uh, that's why we should spend our well-earned five rupees at the end of the week when we had some uh, leftover pocket money. So firstly, it's extremely nostalgic to be back in Ahmedabad. Thanks to you for inviting me. Thank you, Sunil, for having me join you. So I thought I'll just take a few minutes <clears throat> Obviously, Sunil has written a fantastic book. I think you should all, as you get a chance to read it, it probably is, uh, you know, it's written originally, it's organically written, it's organically researched. There's no, you know, hoopla about it, which is exactly what this family stands for. And I think there are some very, very valuable treasures of knowledge, which we nowadays call a lot of management principles. <clears throat> and one thing that struck me about the book, and as you go through it, what we talk of ESG today, I think was being practiced four decades ago by, by this group and family. So I'll probably stop on the book there. I want to take a few minutes and just maybe talk about my relationship uh, with Bridge Mohanji, particularly uh, among the four elder brothers. That's the one that I knew really well. And then, of course, after that, Sunil and Pavan and the families. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I look back, I was trying to think. I'm not that old. I can't remember the anecdotes. I was thinking uh, today on the flight, you know, when I go back in time, when we joined Citibank, the old Citibank, it was all about customers, customers, customers. And um, we were, as an American bank, obviously highly focused on profits. And one of the relationships that I had to manage was the Munjal Group when I was, this is 88, 89, 90. And I used to be in charge of something called cash management, which is, you know, you had to go and pick up the letters of credits, you had to transfer the checks from the big dealers to the treasury. And I tell you, um, my first interaction, well, mostly was with a CFO called Ravi Sood, but then I began to meet Bridge Mohanji quite a bit. You know, it was the most amazing experience. The first time I met a senior CEO and a group chairman level was Bridge Mohanji, and then I got sort of hooked on to, every time I would go to Delhi once a quarter, I would call on him. But what struck me the most is that if you're in the room with him, he's all eyes and ears for you. I mean, the graciousness with which he would give you his time would be amazing. And I think that's something that all of us, you know, take it for granted nowadays. I can tell you how many of us have such short attention spans. We look through people, we don't listen to them. It was amazing how he would sit there get you the cup of tea you want and actually spend the solid 15, 20 minutes with you. And he didn't have anybody coming in the middle and saying, Saab, time ho gaya, you know, <laughs> what people do nowadays, somebody comes and says, here's a parchi. No such flags. I remember that very clearly. And I still remember, you know, his, his, his angle when I was, used to walk in used to always be, Acha bhai, how is Falguni? Uh, how are your mom and dad? He knew that they lived in Jangpura. So, I mean, these things, where would he remember and every, if I met him every four months? But amazing recollection. And I think maybe there was a bond or a chemistry or whatever. But I think that is something that was a huge takeaway, a huge takeaway for me. Well, then I went away to the US. I came back, whatever, 12 years later, 2002, I come back as CEO of City Group. And I go to meet Bridge Mohanji again. And he said, oh, you have come back. Now you're a big man. So what have you done for the last 11, 12 years? I gave him my history. He says, well, Aditya Puri beat you. You know, your boss was tha, now he runs HDFC Bank. And then he's coming and pitching for business harder than you. He gives me better pricing than you do on cash management. So I mean, in his own way, he would create that competitive fervor. And he would make you feel, of course, at ease but not letting your guard down and say, look, there is your old boss who is now one of your biggest competitors. So I think there is a fantastic way of dealing with people. 
all the time in the world for you, all relevant questions about the family, uh, and I think it, it was tremendous. And the one thing I learned about business from him is that, I mean, it didn't really matter to us, but the way he would talk about his vendors, the way he would talk about cash management on one hand, because he would never leave, I think, any idle working capital was never there in the hero group. You never had a day of, I think, idle working capital. They were probably, <laughs> these guys worked on positive cash flows. But anyway, he had a huge eye for that, and the vendors would come and touch his feet. I still remember getting out of the office, and there are vendors standing there, and I mean, they would just seek his blessings. So quite an amazing, you know, huge businessman, uh, family orientation, all the time in the world, if you're sitting with him, and you know, in 89, 80, 90, we were just a relationship managers. And then, of course, as a CEO, no, no change in attitude. It was just absolutely fantastic. Well, one last anecdote, um, you know, in 2004 or five, the government used to never give us branches, you know. Foreign banks were always treated unequally to the Indian banks. So with his help and, you know, a bit of linkages with RBI and the government, we, we got a branch in Ludhiana, which happens to be their hometown. So I went to Bridge Mohanji and said, look, you know, we've got this branch, we still have to seal it. Well, we got it sealed and we got to get us a really good premises. So he got us a 10,000 square foot, three side open branch in the Ludhiana Stock Exchange, which is our flagship branch, by the way. And that's the kind of contact, I'm sure it, it's not a big deal, but the fact that he did it, went out of his way, okay, to help a foreign bank to do this was, was something. Then we go on the Shatabdi Express, and he's giving all my managers lots of words of wisdom on, on the way to Ludhiana. And in Ludhiana, he spoke to our guests as a chief guest. I mean, it took a full day out. You go Shatabdi in the morning, and we came back late night. And while leaving our little uh, party, I still remember him telling our branch manager, that you've got to stand at the gate at least one hour a day of your branch to say either hello or bye-bye to your customers because that's why you exist. So quite, quite something, and I think it's, it's just terrific. You know, I look back and I sometimes I do miss him, uh, but look, life is that. Well, the legacy continues. I think I know Sunil now for many years. The beauty is that there is no give and take. There is no business. It's just a bond that has continued for a long time on really, as I say, no acts. Um, you know, I've been going to all the Diwali parties. We lose all the money when I go there on Teen Patti. But we, every year we get invited to that. Every year we get invited to their family events. Uh, we invite them to all our, you know, weddings in the family. So it's become a bond. But I think with the unspoken thing, which I don't know how many of you know, you know, the Sunil, I mean, is doing a couple of very interesting things, which I'm now discovering. Okay, one I think is inculcating and really incubating entrepreneurs big time. Big time. And I think it's not just about the money he brings to the table, but the time that he's spending with entrepreneurs to give them the confidence. Because you know, a lot of entrepreneurs start up and then half of them fade away. So I think his advice and help and spending time with them with real business experience, I think is going to go a long way. I don't know how many of you know, but there's a, he'll probably talk about it. Hundreds of companies he's investing in, and I think he's probably at least helping 50, 60 of them by spending time with them and being available at any point. In. I think that's a huge thing. Secondly, the family, again, unspoken, unknown, lots of philanthropic activity. This is not a family or a house where you'll hear about what the foundation is doing. In fact, I only discovered two, three months ago when this medical college that they have in Ludhiana, the medical hospital, 1,500 beds as big as Ames, built over God knows how many decades. I'm not sure how many of you know this, but this is one of the most preeminent hospitals in that part of the world. So. You know, they've been doing things very quietly, and I think that's a very important takeaway coming down from their dad. So look, these are all things that may sound, you know, anecdotal, they may sound useful, but for me as a professional, for me as a family guy, for me now in my kind of the tertiary career where you basically what matters is families and bonds and stakeholder management, I think there's a lot to learn from the from my association with the bridge Mohanji and and ongoing with the Munjal family so pleasure to be here privileged to be invited and always good to be back in Ahmedabad thank you so thank you Sanjay for those uh, nice anecdotes so can I invite Professor Harold D'Souza to please give us sh small memento from IMA to Mr. Nair Sanjay <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. So we will now watch a short clip of the hero group and I request the AV team to please volume can be increased. Yeah. From the bylanes of Kamalia and the rugged landscapes of Quetta, they escape to India with little more than the shirts on their backs. In the partition ravaged cities of Amritsar, Agra and Delhi, four of the six Munjal brothers, Dayanand, Satyanand, Brij Mohanlal and Om Prakash, built their business part by part. Armed with nothing but self-belief, the brothers began with trading and then manufacturing bicycle parts which soon evolved into the production of bicycles. For post-independence India, the hero bicycle gave wings to the aspirations of the common man. By 1986, 30 years after its inception, Hero Cycles became the largest bicycle maker in the world. In the next 15 years, the motorcycle venture, Hero Honda, repeated the feat. And both pole positions are held firmly even today. Hero's story is about humble beginnings, the refugee entrepreneurial spirit, hard work and zeal. It looks at how four brothers with little formal education created a world-class enterprise. This is the incredible tale of a principle-driven organization that created exceptional value for a society that desperately needed transportation. How did four brothers with distinct personalities work like a cohesive unit and build a manufacturing behemoth? How did they synchronize their strengths? How did they resolve their differences, if any? The story goes deep inside the family spirit, the parivar, that brought together employees, customers, channel partners, suppliers and local communities to create success, welfare and well-being for millions. This is the making of Hero. Four brothers, two wheels, and a revolution that shaped India. It is definitely nostalgic. I can remember riding the Hero cycle, uh, which my parents bought for me. So. Thank you. Uh, let us get on to the event, main part of the event. I would want to introduce uh, the two panelists and uh, our moderator. So I'll begin with inviting on stage our, our director, Professor Errol D'Souza, if you can come on the stage, uh, please. I will now uh, come to the main uh, uh, chief guest of our event, Mr. Sunil Kant Munchal. If you can uh, please come on the stage, please. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal is one of the founder promoters of the Hero Group, India's premier automotive manufacturing group. 
that has evolved from the world's largest bicycle maker to the largest two-wheeler maker. He is the chairman of Hero Enterprise with interest in insurance, distribution steel making, real estate and corporate training. He has made strategic investments in several areas ranging from e-commerce to hospitality. He also supports startups on digital le learning, community transportation, healthcare, women empowerment and education. Sri Munjal chairs the board and runs the Dune School and sits on the board of IIM Ahmedabad, ISB and SRCC. He has co-founded BML Munjal University and is the president of the Dayanand Medical College and Hospital Lodhiana. He has also served as the president of CII and AIMA, been a member of the Prime Minister's Council on Trade and Industry and was on government task forces that prepared the ground for India's banking and insurance reforms. Mr. Munjal has set up the Serendipity Arts Foundation which aims to revive patronage in the arts. He is also the president of the Ludhiana Sanskritic Samagam which supports performing arts across North India. He has also chronicled, as we all have known now, the incredible saga of heroes founders in the book The Making of Hero and the book was featured amongst India's prominent bestsellers for several months and has recently won the Business Book of the Year Award at the Tata Literature Live Festival 2020. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So, so now I would want to introduce and invite on stage Mr. Siddharth Zarabi, Managing Editor, Business Today TV, who is going to moderate the discussion with Mr. Munjal and Professor D'Souza this evening. If I could also just take a minute to introduce Mr. Siddharth Zarabi. Mr. Siddharth Zarabi is the managing editor of Business Today TV and is an award-winning media professional. Mr. Zarabi is among, <laughs> among India's best-known journalists with over two decades of experience as a results-oriented decisive leader. He has served stints at Bloomberg TV, CNBC TV 18, Hindustan Times, The Financial Express, and Business Standard. He has led newsrooms in Mark Huey India Print Companies, as well as headed two business news channels with global partners. Credited with multiple content and platform innovations in the fiercely competitive news industry, he has deep knowledge and wide experience across the media value chain. It is a pleasure and he has very kindly accepted the invitation to moderate this discussion with Mr. Munjal and Professor. Thank you very much Thank for you. that rather detailed introduction. Uh, uh, rarely do I get that opportunity. Uh, a very warm welcome once again. Hello and welcome. Namaskar to all of you who are here on behalf of not just the hosts, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Munjal, uh, Professor Souza, and on behalf of Business Today and the India Today group, it's an absolute privilege and uh, honor to be uh, discussing what is clearly a fascinating book. Uh, I was surprised, uh, Sunil, and we'll dive right into it, that you've kind of uh, taken care of a hundred years of history, and I thought as we were uh, getting on the stage that uh, it's not a story just about the making of hero, it's also a story told from the sidelines about the making of India as we can uh, see it today. So I want to begin by uh, asking you to tell uh, all those who are here and those who are also watching us, uh, what was the motivation beyond just uh, scoring and putting down the legacy of your uh, family business? So thank you, Siddharth, for, for actually pointing out that in some ways it is India's story. Uh, and, and you're right, because the idea was to try and figure out in concentric circles the story of the company, the family, manufacturing, the nation as it evolved from a tentative new nation to a much more confident 
and an emerging nation, and also at the same time what was happening in the world. So, uh, twofold. One, of course, uh, the story of uh, the family and what they did, building in one generation an enterprise which produced multiple successful companies, but more than just companies, the impact that it had on people and society. Uh, I think that was an important uh, story that needed to be told, but also how India in its early days, through the struggle of independence to becoming an independent nation and how to, to develop its economy, what it did, I thought it would be an interesting combination uh, to put these two together. The request for writing a book on my father or the family or the companies had been coming for decades actually, 20 or 30 year plus years. And his normal response would be, nahi, apne baare mein baat nahi karte. Yeah. It's not nice to talk about yourself. Uh, after 25 years of, of uh, requests, he finally agreed. And unfortunately, we lost him before that could be written. Uh, and we had actually appointed a team to do this. Subsequently, the request still came. So I thought it's a story that since he had agreed, we should write. And who would know this better than someone from the inside? That's a wonderful uh, point that you make and you've written an a insider's account. I would say it's uh, candid and I know that if, if you feel like it, you'll probably be able to churn out three or four similar books. Uh, uh, you can do sequels because that's the amount of letters, for example, uh, that uh, you have received and you alluded to that in the book. I'm going to try and keep this um, like a rapid fire. So the first question uh, that I want to uh, take to you, a lot of people say Startup India and the birth of entrepreneurship. I want to counter that by saying that India, uh, which you also mention in the book, had been deindustrialized for several centuries, has been a startup nation. Uh, in your experience, as we talk about startups and we have perhaps just about 50 unicorns uh, currently, uh, navigating from a controlled license Raj economy to a situation where uh, Indian companies and families learned to interface and work with uh, foreign partners who had access to larger amounts of capital and of course technology to a situation that prevails uh, now, without taking names, uh, we are now talking about uh, Indian education company that's uh, looking at a listing at a $48 billion valuation. So imagine uh, those numbers. Sunil, give us that sense of the span and arc of history in terms of business. So actually, you could have asked Sanjay this question because <laughs> Sanjay and his, his family have just done something similarly miraculous only recently. Uh, but you're right, uh, startups as a concept is not new. Our company was a startup in, in, the, in the early 50s, as were many, many others, which are today standing established uh, organizations. Just the concept of startups based heavily on technology, new knowledge, connectivity, and driven by e-commerce is a relative new, com uh, a new concept. Also, the amount of innovation that's going into uh, the current ideation of the concept of these new startups, I think, is very creditable. Uh, but uh, I, I do, and I've said this actually multiple times, I don't think startups as a concept is new in India. It's been around for a long time. Uh, I do sometimes worry that our focus uh, becomes excessively only on a few and only those who have achieved valuations of billions of dollars. Uh, the startups are coming up in tens of thousands uh, across the nation and doing all kinds of amazing things. I'm, I'm actually very keenly interested. Uh, as Sanjay said, we are actually supporting many, many of them, especially those who are doing things which have a positive impact on society. And there are many of them in, in a whole host of areas of logistics, of waste management, of uh, eco-friendly technologies. It's just amazing what all is going on. And I think we need to figure out a way to encourage them more and more. I I'll also bring in uh, Professor D'Souza into the conversation, but before I do that, I'm going to honestly recommend this as a, a management uh, graduate myself, this book to everyone, uh, whether you are a student, aspiring manager, someone even chasing billion dollar valuations, there are a lot of insights in this book. 
two key dates that uh, stand out. Uh, and when I was reading this uh, book, I kind of noticed that the arc of everything that was good and bad about um, the industrial controls in India is captured in this book without uh, doubt. For example, and it's interesting that we are talking about it a few days or weeks after the farm laws were repealed, private wholesale food grain trade was abolished in 1973. Uh, the JV, the JV that kind of made the group what it is and uh, made them leapfrog from where they were, took three years of due diligence from a Japanese Honda, three years of due diligence, and Sanjay would probably know better whether any investor or uh, entrepreneur will have the patience for a three-year due diligence. All of these incidents, in hindsight, uh, for a company that is so Swadeshi, partnering with a foreign company, staying with them for so many years, and then kind of going your own separate paths, how uh, would you categorize that experience, and what are the top two or three lessons that you would like to share with us? So I think one was the recognition that while in bicycles and mopeds we were quite successful, but we knew very little uh, about businesses beyond that which had higher automation, um, uh, more technology uh, used, uh, specifically the two-wheeler business. And the government of India had opened a small window at that time for joint ventures for two-wheelers. And that's when many of the giant companies came in, Yamaha came in, uh, Suzuki came in with the TVS, Yamaha came in with Escorts, uh, and um, Kawasaki came in with Bajaj, and Honda had looked around, they were the last ones incidentally. They had looked around and spent a lot of time, 140 companies had applied to Ind from India for this partnership uh, to Honda, because it was a giant and a leader even at that time. And the last 20 companies were visited multiple times by them, it was quite an experience, that itself. Uh, maybe a separate book can be written only about that, by the way. Uh, and at the end of it, they probably knew more about us than we knew ourselves. Not probably, almost definitely. Uh, because they would come with their cameras, there were no smart devices in those days, and diaries, and note every single thing you said. And it was interesting, on a second, a third, a fourth visit, they would ask a question, and if you responded, they said, but this is what you said six months ago. And this is something different you said six months ago. In our case, the thing is, as Indians, we are normally instinctive in our response. Uh, we are not as studied as they are. So there was a great deal of learning uh, from them. The, 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 what made that partnership special? In fact, McKinsey or one of the big consulting firms wrote an article once saying, this is the longest running large global joint venture of a Japanese company in the world. And we don't think it's because of the Japanese partners. <laughs> it's because of the... Uh, th there's, a, there's a very good anecdote, and I'm just going to take two words and let Sunil expand on that. Dekhi uh, Jaigi was a pivotal moment when at the very last moment, and I would say that if you've uh, uh, gone to uh, marry X and suddenly you were asked to marry Y, <laughs> that was a situation and added to that a question. Um, do you think it was a, a, a stroke of luck and fate uh, that you ended up making motorcycles? So, uh, as is acknowledged very often by successful leaders, luck has a lot to do with success. Many things around us. First, the blessings of the Almighty are something we don't often credit enough. And then many things around us falling into place at the right time, right place. Uh, the, what Siddharth is referring to is the last conversation that was held between Hiro and Honda on this partnership. Uh, in Tokyo, the Japanese told my father that we are willing to partner with you. This is when they brought the list down from 20 to the last two. But we will offer you a motorcycle and not a scooter. Please remember, India was a scooter country in those days. So there was a little bit of hesitation. So my father picked up the phone and called my uncle, Om Prakashji. And he said, this is what has been said. And my uncle got a shock. He said, but how can we do that? My father said, ye bhi dekh lenge. If this is an opportunity, we will make it work. As we have done many times earlier, because they had started, please remember, they had started from scratch with nothing. And they built that business to where it got to. And that, in some sense, he actually said, we will do this. But we will define some of the specifications that we want, which are appropriate for the Indian market, despite the Japanese offering a slightly different set of specs. I don't know if that is covered in the book or not. 
uh, the specs they offered were different from what was actually picked finally. Well, well I noticed there was yeah. a debate about the 100 cc <laughs> and the pricing, of course. Yes, and, and they, they, they wanted to offer an 80 cc 75, which was very popular in the southeast, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and in, in all of those countries. Uh, and uh, my father and our team, my brother Ramanji, uh, incidentally, was the founding CEO of this company. Uh, we lost him, as you know, in 91. And uh, Bhavan was also along. And they insisted that we want 100 cc because it has to be a heavy load carrier in India, as we had done in bicycles. And, and, and they knew where the success of the bicycle came from. It had to be low priced and it had to be sturdy at the same time. It had to be sophisticated in technology, but easy to maintain. So there was some conflicting... A and uh, give you a lot of mileage as well. Yeah, <laughs> so that was one of the features which actually also made it distinctive, as, as you know. There's one very interesting passage in the book, and this is about how um, uh, your f uh, late father uh, went into great detail in terms of engineering about the load-bearing capacity, not just of the motorcycle, but about the original cycles, because there's an anecdote about how three brothers would themselves use one cycle, and many of us here would perhaps recall those days. Professor D'Souza, if I can bring you in, because uh, Sunil, as the book has been written, it, it's a very simple book. It's a management book. I would highly recommend it. But it's been written in a layman's tone and tonality, so it has great appeal. Yet, let's try and bring in some management jargon. This is a group that has seen a lot of downfalls. It's seen loss. It's seen the heights of profitability. And then a sudden uh, black swan event uh, wiping it all away. In management terms, what does the lesson uh, about the hero group, the making of the group and where it stands today represent for the current generation of entrepreneurs and businessmen in India? Okay, so I actually would like to start by saying that it's not just a management book. It's also a book about history. Yes. And, you know, what's central to me about the book is the culture of the family and how that, I think, was the basis by which they could do all the great things that they did. Specifically, you know, what stands out to me is two things. One is strong sense of honesty, okay, which in business, uh, you know, as we know, it can take you both ways. There's this wonderful story in the book about uh, his, uh, the time when, you know, there was a lack of food in India, and uh, one of the brothers found food somewhere in a barn or something and brought it home. And the grandfather said, please, just take it back. We may be hungry, but someone may have stored this food out of great risk. And it's important that that family does not get denied because of what we do. Okay. Now, that is a sense of honesty that, you know, if it can, if you can be honest in a time of crisis, uh, you know, I mean, you've sort of sowed the seeds of greatness. Uh, Be before I go back to Sunil, uh, just one quick point, uh, mm. and this is again for, for those, uh, because sometimes it becomes very fashionable and trendy to blame business, sorry, corporate chore, and there was a phase in the recent past, I'm not going into the politics of it, but if you look at the arc, and since you said about history, if we trace India's industrial history, business history, there was a phase of great capital controls going to the Sarkar for everything. Then there was this period of opening three, four decades back, and there was a bit of Wild West capitalism. And to the current phase, sir, how would you describe uh, the current phase of the business landscape today in India? No, I think, you know, one of the things that... Uh you know, Sanjay said was striking about the group, uh, the way in which you manage capital, okay? If there's one thing, you know, which is anathema to me as a management educator, and, you know, it's what the group represents is that the group is totally against debt, okay? I mean, it, it is a group which basically believes in somehow economizing on capital and sort of taking that forward, you know? And I think, you know, that is a sort of a rarity in Indian business. Uh, to me, it's so natural that, you know, if you want to grow, you take on debt, you know, I mean, it's so not so an Sunil, issue. Sunil, come in on this because uh, taking on debt is very natural and I'm not talking about the NPA uh, uh, 
a crisis. I'm talking in terms of startups and companies are taking on debt plus, of course, venture equity financing and there is no uh, roadmap for profitability. How does that fly in the face of what he just pointed out? So, uh, Errol is right. In, in our organization and in our family, we have been very risk averse as far as debt is concerned. We've taken plenty of risks in business, by the way, on products and services, on markets and technologies. Uh, but debt is something we've tried to stay away from, to the, even to, uh, against criticism from many analysts, who'd say, because you guys don't borrow, you're not going fast enough. Mm. Our question was, you show us a company that's growing faster. And we're doing this with our own resources. What can actually be better? We actually borrowed in the early days of what was then Hero Honda. We borrowed from IFC Washington. And in two years, we prepaid them. So anytime I meet anyone from World Bank, they always remind me that you are one of our examples of somebody who we are happy with and also very unhappy with. Was this yeah. a cultural thing or yeah. was this a business practice that you followed? It's both. It's both. Uh, and and uh, Sanjay is right, we've always attempted to keep a negative working capital cycle. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get advances or current payments from most of our customers and suppliers had a, a payment period, but that payment period was always maintained strictly. We never delayed any, any supplier's payment. In Ludhiana, since you're talking of old time, in Hero Cycles, every Saturday afternoon, the payments were made to suppliers. It was well known the payments would be made for two to, from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. There was a window in, in one of the offices where they would come and just collect their, their checks. Anyone could write their own check if they knew they were expecting one from Hero Cycles. And if they didn't come at 5 o'clock, the check was actually mailed to them. And that was a completely unusual practice in this country. And maybe to some extent it still is. So my advice to many of the startups that we work with is take cash, take, take debt, but watch your cash. Okay, and this is very important advice because a lot of youngsters who might be watching this, people who are uh, wishing to start up or have probably already begun the journey, uh, one of the key uh, factors that is different in today's business landscape in India is access to capital. Uh, Sanjay knows this uh, uh, and he's uh, funded uh, some very big names in Indian business uh, currently. You yourself have spawned God knows how many companies. Uh, how different is the access of capital now versus 30 years back when you were, uh, you know, perhaps getting your feet established in the business? Uh, certainly very different. It's not just that there is more access, there is more variety of funding instruments available. You can create many layers under which you can actually uh, take debt and some companies have done that. To an extent, it's beneficial, but beyond a point, I think it's very dangerous because it lulls you into a sense of comfort without realizing you take debt in entities which have no cash flows, which don't have revenues. And banks were, by the way, and banks and, and NBFCs were happy to give that money. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need a source for servicing and repayment. So in our case, if we do take, we, we, by the way, we don't never take debt but we hardly ever take debt. When we do take debt, we want to ensure, even more than the banks giving us the money, that we have the ability to not just service it, but to pay it many times over. Uh, one of the other things, and I don't know how many people in this audience uh, would know that there's another storied uh, business family from Ludhiana. Sunil shares uh, his first name with uh, the key person there. I'm talking about uh, what was originally founded as Mitt Baroz. Sunil Mittal, uh, and they of course uh, went overseas. Uh, they have a large telecom network in the African continent. The context of the question is, for your group, which, uh, which uh, has exported, I don't know how much in terms of volume and value, uh, why weren't you, uh, at least in public perception, part of that phase where a lot of Indian companies went global and said, we've done India, now we have to rule over the world, and many of them have done pretty well. Many have been bitten very badly. So we did go overseas, but in a different manner. So we were exporting to 90 countries, uh, by the way. So we set up assembly plants in some of the countries. Uh, Sri Lanka was the first one I can think of. This is going back uh, three or four decades. 
and now for the two wheelers there's an assembly plant in bangladesh assembly plant in colombia in africa so we've done this but we've done this with connected businesses what you are talking of is people who's went and acquired companies across across the globe so we have always been our strategy has always been very conservative the aggression is reserved for operations not for strategy okay <laughs> how many in this hall uh, know the story behind how this group Uh, came to be branded hero uh, i won't come to you but is there anyone who can raise his hand no i'm i'm ruling you out as a professor of business education <laughs> is there anyone else uh, okay so that brings me to the next question tell us the story about how uh, the brand hero came into being you're talking of a time long before things like intellectual property registration etc came to be Uh, when it is common for us to pick any name and and use them uh, when my father and two of my uncles were doing trading of bicycle parts in amritsar and around partition time one of the people they were dealing with used to make saddles um, uh, and his brand was hero he was going back to what became pakistan and my uncle asked him do you mind we like this name do you mind if we use hero he saying how can i mind it's up to you you use it and it was that simple and that of course uh, over a period of time became uh, inextricably linked to what we do as a business and as a family but the beginning was not a grand plan exactly like the business the business was not started with the plan to build the business, biggest company in the world it was started as a business to survive and provide for the family i think it's just the good practices and to errol's point the philosophical underpinnings in how it was practiced that actually allowed it to grow Uh, this uh, that's a very interesting cue for me but before i go to that i want to uh, uh, request you to tell our audience uh, when was the first time you uh, were involved in a formal business plan the kind that is absolutely necessary today uh, no venture financer would let anyone even inside the door unless there were 15 20 30 slides uh, top quality when did you see such a plan in term full of management jargon So um our businesses when they started were obviously instinctive businesses started by uh, as i said my father and his brothers but as they kept growing and they did grow uh, so one of the things that happened I, i'm going to take a little, slightly a little bit of a story before i come there if you don't mind um when they started making bicycles the first thing that happened was the government of india at that time manu bhai shah was the industry minister jawala nehru was the prime minister they were very keen to build indian manufacturing in small industry they felt that large industry would only be public sector steel plants dams etc the small manufacturing could be small uh, uh, small industry and the punjab chief minister at that time pratap singh kairo was very keen to develop uh, industry in punjab and agriculture at the same time so they encouraged my father to apply for this license so 128 companies got license to make bicycles in one day in india i don't know how many 20 or 30 of them were in ludhiana itself so that was the beginning of hero cycles my father went and returned the license you know people said you must be crazy because license in india used to be license to print money because everything was always in short supply he said we want a license but not one restricted to small scale I don't want to be held back we want to be able to do what we can do fortunately the license uh, got changed to a, um, uh, the condition for small scale was removed and they made 7500 bicycles year one and they just kept never looked back but what they found was you couldn't make as many bicycles as you could sell because what the british had done was entire value addition in everything including the bicycle industry was taken out to the uk so things like hubs tires chains rims pedals all used to come from uh, free wheels all used to come from companies like dunlop and rally from england and was sold through what were called agency houses so they said this won't do if you get a thousand tires you can only make 500 bicycles so they went around asking friend family and friends are you interested in make uh, bicycle parts we can help you select what to make how to make it what machines to use but two things we will not do for you we will not fund the business for you we will not run the business for you Okay, you have to be your own entrepreneur. And by the way, we may be cousins or friends uh, out here, but the moment we enter the office, we are business associates. So this concept of arms-length pricing, 
transactions being done in an impartial manner was actually set up right from the beginning at that time. So in some sense, they did start to plan, but in a different way uh, from the question you're asking. I know, I know you're leading on to a different, uh, so I just thought I'll mention something which is a little bit uh, uh, interesting as well. And that's when the first plant also for, uh, by the family was set up to make uh, uh, chains and then later on hubs which became uh, Rockman Cycle, then Highway. And then many of these companies became component suppliers, built a wonderful concentration until Ludhiana became the largest bicycle component make maker in the world. Absolutely. And Professor, set up a supply chain system. Absolutely. Professor, um, since we are talking about uh, the, the pre-independence phase, the deindustrialization and agency houses, I just want to ask you, uh, companies like Hero represent Swadeshi manufacturing even before the word became fashionable uh, in, in the media. There was a phase of reforms which impacted manufacturing within India and the philosophy was let's import uh, and that's happened across sectors. Now you of course see a policy push. Uh, in terms of uh, where we stood vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and there's a very interesting anecdote about uh, China also in this book, uh, do you think that we stand a chance as far as manufacturing is concerned? Can large manufacturing enterprises like Hero be set up now? I'm going to be a little frank on this one. The answer is no. <laughs> they w it requires strong entrepreneurial skills. Uh, India, I mean, you know, you look at the path of history, never encouraged manufacturing. And I believe even with Make in India today, that is not strictly true. Okay? Uh, if you look at, say, you know, manufacturing economy, think of China. As economies develop, you know, agriculture reduces in scope, and then you become industrialized, and finally a services economy. I mean, India at independence was something like, you know, 70% agriculture. Today it's 14%, okay? You should have seen that gap in industry, in fact, it's services. And the story there is the story that Sunil is telling. It's about, you know, how the license Raj actually stunted Indian industry the way the banking system was run, okay, the way finance was basically uh, grew in the country. And the thing that, you know, all entrepreneurs were always in some sense seen as tainted and too close to politics, okay. Uh, you know, what we would call as cronyism, okay. Uh, so it's difficult. I mean, I'm not saying it's not, it can't be done and it's not done, okay. There are, you know, some outstanding examples but I think those go against the grain for one very simple reason. They have a very strong culture, which is you know, what the hero group is also about. Uh, it, it's a culture of building relationships and being very frank about it. Uh, you know, one of the astounding things to me in a family business is that you, know, you have the back of everybody but at the same time, you are, you know, uh, very frank about how they need to operate. You know, there's this lovely story about how one of the brothers who did the distribution uh, was not finding customers, you know. And the other brother calls up and says, you know, doesn't look like you're good at this, come back home, okay. And it's like, you know, a rap on the knuckles, you know. Uh, and then this guy took it, you know, on his shoulders went across the country you know, on th uh, in a third class reserve compartment, stayed in the cheapest of hotels, and finally got the biggest customer base by building goodwill. I mean, what and we would call And then his brother goodwill. noticed and gave instructions for that to change. Yeah. So Neil, uh, the, uh, the, this is the point I want to ask you because uh, uh, this point about joint families came up. Let me ask you very s straight up, uh, why was there a family rearrangement and I'm not using the word split, it was a reorganization, an amicable reorganization. Uh, couldn't joint family and your kind of uh, family with the uh, moorings in the culture that it has stayed together as a business? So actually this is a very important aspect of business. First, amongst my father and his brothers, there was unbelievable coordination and understanding. Complete trust with, on each other. Each one was distinctly different in their style and character and behavior, but complementary to the other. Yeah. And I think that was a wonderful, wonderful relationship. 
and an operating system at the same time. In the morning, my father and uncle, they lived in the same house, uh, uh, two twin homes without a wall. So when they were shaving, they were talking about business. And sitting at the table, they were talking about what's going on. So all of us, by osmosis, learnt a lot of that. Uh, I myself got a fair bit of exposure because I got involved in the family business network, looked at how family businesses were run worldwide. As a subject, I had lectured on this in many parts of the world. So I had actually went to my father and my uncle and I said, we should consider this, we should consider restructuring because each generation of ours has been brought up differently. We have sent our younger generation to better and better institutions for education, encourage them to be independent minded and when they come back, if we tell them, you should do what I'm telling you, that would be unfair. That's not the right thing to do. And at any time, any of them would stand up and say, but I don't want to do this, I want to do something else. And, and they actually got upset with me, both of them. They said, exactly to the point you're making, that people give examples of our family, how the family is so close, and how we work uh, so well, and the businesses are doing so well. I said, exactly. Who thinks of doing it at this time? The, normal, the norm is, this starts when families either have a fight amongst the members of the family or when some business is going downhill. And then everyone is pulling in a different direction. You will not have an amicable uh, uh, reorganization. And we did. We had a restructuring, which the first time the world heard of this was when we announced it ourselves. That it's actually been done. It was done deliberately. It was done thoughtfully. And it, it took almost manner, three anyone, years plus to… It took almost four years, yeah. Almost four years. That's, yes. That's very interesting and, yeah. and, and a quick uh, point on this too. Those who are now building up businesses and will become mature businesses in the future, what would you tell them when it comes to, uh, you know, separating the family part and the professionals part uh, in today's context? So one of… Uh, so an interesting thing that I learned when I looked at family businesses around the world is that about 80 plus percent of the issues are common around the globe. The solutions, however, is unique for every individual family. The one thing which was common was that there are some, and it's well known now, 94% of the, the family-owned businesses will uh, destroy themselves in, three, in the third generation. Yeah. And that's is recorded, it's, it's enough research to show that. The interesting thing is the 6% go on and on and on beyond that. Now what's distinctive about the 6% is the lesson that one needs to learn. One is the ability to, to clearly distinguish between ownership and management. That's the number one lesson. Uh, too few of us uh, understand, accept or spend any time on this. The normal understanding in, in a majority of family owned businesses, if I have the same last name, I have a right to this job or role. And I think that's automatically destroys culture, value, understanding, regard and respect. And that takes you downhill. If the members of the family are actually put through the, the drill tougher than any professional, their appraisal and assessment is good quality and the feedback is objective, okay, which is rare, but it's exactly to the point you're making, Errol. If the family member is told, this is not okay, you can't do this. And the other thing I think is, too many people get forced to do things that they don't like. So what we did, uh, other than uh, restructuring was, we've encouraged the young people in the family to follow their passion. We have a fashion designer in the family, we have a chocolatier in the family, we have uh, you know, someone running a university in the family, and we have said, this is, you can actually afford to do this, so please go and do it. Uh, isn't that also yeah. true because uh, they didn't have to survive like… Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think because we have the ability to, to make choices and say yes or no, it would be a shame then to force everybody to do what I think is right. What I think is right may be right for me. It may not be right for you. Absolutely. How about the, uh, the, the split with uh, Honda? Uh, it was a partnership that was crafted over the years and it was very successful. How did that pan out? What was the result for the entire group? So this partnership ran for 27 years. In the first 10 to 12 years, we learned a lot from Honda. And they were an amazing partner. They are, they are literally miles ahead in the way they think of technology, of design, and their ability to be meticulous in not only in planning, but also in execution is amazing. In the last 15 years of the partnership, 
Lots and lots of ideas went from here into their system. So these companies became successful. Please remember the culture of, of doing this was already there in the hero cycle and majestic auto days. We've been doing this in many of companies in Highway and Rockman and many, many others. And I think that both made them happy and made them upset because here's an upstart coming out of nowhere suddenly has become the largest company in the world. Please remember the company we, be we beat to become number one was Honda itself. Mm. And also we had signed two or three conditions at the start. In 84, Japan was where it was, India was where it was, and we were a company who had no clue about this business when we were entering. That R&D would be done in Japan, which was very good, because Japan was the world leader. Please remember when this was done. And that any export out of India would happen with Honda's prior permission. So uh, because that was not forthcoming and they had set up their own 100% own subsidiary, it seemed only fair that they concentrate and focus on theirs while we focus on our entity to allow both of them room and scope to grow. And it was a difficult uh, decision to make. Uh, but clearly the time for that had come, which is why we were able to do it in a uh, nice, friendly way so that each one went their own way and we are now uh, competitors. But as individuals, we are still friends. Why not compete? Uh, uh, why didn't you consider competing in the four-wheeler space? Why stick to two-wheelers? So we did think about four-wheelers a few times. We even had conversations with Honda actually to partner. Uh, but we wanted to, to make sure that we would be in the driving seat in any such uh, uh, partnership. Also, that four wheel was, was becoming a very, very tough market. You must remember, other than Maruti, most other companies in India struggle to even make money, much less to be uh, thriving. And so we were very, again, going back to the, the, the cautious uh, strategy. We didn't think it was actually uh, timely or smart for us to get into that business, so we started diversifying. We went into clean energy, we went into financial services, we went into other areas. Uh, as I said at the start, we don't publicize everything we do, but we had 32 companies the day we restructured that. I think that is in the book. And today, across the group, while they are separately owned, there must be 50 or 60 companies. Uh, Sunil, I just want, as a business leader, to ask you about the future of electric mobility, because that's the big buzzword, and I cannot not uh, ask you that question here. So, the, as far as clean energy is concerned, it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. That's clear, the direction for the whole world is clear. India has made its decision. Every company in India has started moving in that direction. Two things, however, I, I actually said this a little bit earlier to someone else. The technology for electric vehicles is not new. It's been around for 100 years. It's just that the existing companies with the sunk cost that they had, already invested, were not willing to, to venture out. It's only when newbies, to your point, the startups, who are either computer companies or doing something completely different, said, I'm going to put two seats and four wheels on this computer, and this is my new car. That shook up the entire industry. And the awareness of the quality impact on, on the air quality of uh, polluting vehicles was coming more and more into focus in, in the last few years. So this shift had to come. It is still not clear to me what is the ideal technology, what will win out in, in a long period of time. But today, the electrically motor driven uh, vehicle clearly is the winning one. I don't know if it's the, it's the one which will link the long term uh, war. This battle, clearly it's winning. And I don't know of any com automotive company in the world which is not shifting to that. Uh, in terms of our automotive sector, the, the Japanese and Maruti are credited with creating a completely new revolution as far as four-wheelers are concerned. Are you able to pin uh, down as to who will be the, uh, the equivalent of Japan and Maruti in the e-mobility e space? It's very hard to say. So there are two, two diametrically opposite views on this. One is that the startups who are coming have no baggage. So they can just bring in all the newest stuff and then uh, take off from there. The other view is, while the startups, some of them, by the way, uh, are already in and have uh, an edge in terms of timing, that, please remember, it's not always the first mouse which catches the cheese. Huh? So the large companies have resources, distribution, 
dealerships, ability for, uh, for upkeep and maintenance, and also the ability to provide financing models, which some of the new ones may not. So the answer is not easy. Uh, I do believe some of the existing large enterprises will come up, come back with the bank from where they are right now. So what you're saying is it's, it's easy to probably do a flash sale on an e-commerce portal uh, and brand it well, but uh, selling an automobile product is a 10-year, 5-year, 15, 20-year engagement, at least till the life of the vehicle. Uh, and it's not just about selling it. Yeah. yeah. So when you sell it, your relationship starts. It doesn't end that day. It's not sell it uh, and forget it, it's, it's a continuation. Just a couple of quick points before I uh, uh, hand it back to Professor Vishal Gupta. Uh, this is a question that I ask every business leader, so I'm going to do that once again. Uh, are entrepreneurs born? Do they have a fair share of higher luck than the average individual? And can entrepreneurship be taught or is it just within your DNA? Big question, try and give us an answer on that. So I'll give you half the answer. I'll, I'll suggest Errol should give the second half. I, I can give it, but I think he, he can probably do a better job And I'll job probably than get me. a mic to Sanjay yeah. on that as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the belief earlier was that entrepreneurs are only born. Okay. And it's genetic, that people who run good enterprises, their progeny will continue to have uh, the skill to run more enterprises. We find today that's actually not true. It's not limited only to a few. People who are willing to make, take a risk, people who are willing to lead by example, people who are willing to take that leap and have the empathy for people around them. I'm not even talking about business now. The, the qualities of a leader are actually qualities of a business leader as well. Any successful leader, if you look at them, there are four or five things that actually uh, set them apart from others. It is exactly the same for entrepreneurs. Professor. Well, I mean, I think the family is a good example of, you know, how do you answer this question? I mean, his father started out five years on a farm, okay? I mean, who would have thought that he would get into cycles, okay? Then he goes, works for an ordnance factory, which produces or, you know, and they're doing repairs of cycles. So he learns something out there. So, you know, I think entrepreneurship is a matter of luck but it's also a matter of recognizing that this is my calling and I'm going to invest my whole being into this. There's no two ways about it. I can't step back even 2% because if I do, that business is going to go nowhere, okay? Do entrepreneurs, you know, are all entrepreneurs going to be successful and is it in the genes? No, we have good examples of that. I mean, you know, the uh, Vanderbilt was like one of the you know, biggest entrepreneurs in the world, built a large, you know, wealth fund, etc. Three generations down, everyone was living in penury. Okay? The largest Indian family in Singapore, you know, uh, which was, the, I don't want to take any names, which was the wealthiest family, within a generation ran out of all the wealth. Okay? So, uh, sir, if I may interrupt you, uh, you've uh, taught probably thousands of students. Uh, why is it that venture capital only chases IIT and IM brand names to a large extent. There are a lot of uh, exceptions as well. And when we do these shows, a lot of people come up and say, hey, I have this burning desire inside me and I know I can do it, but you know, I don't have that tag on my uh, card. It's just selection, pure selection. I mean, we select the best. Uh, and so, you know, it's just that, you know, I mean, may, I believe we, we just add a little bit of value to them. They are actually very entrepreneurial by the time they've even joined us. Uh, and then they just go on to live their dreams. I mean, As a know? percentage, sir, is there a difference? Uh, if you went back in history, you would see that a, a big percentage of uh, entrepreneurs who had made it big had perhaps uh, very little education. But now there is obviously more education available can you comment on that? Is it necessary? Can, can a person who is not educated uh, formally and significantly hope to become a large businessman? If he's not educated, he needs to have experience. That's the big difference today, I would say. Education is so important, mainly because most, you know, anything that you do today has got to have a tech edge to it. Uh, if you don't pick up the tech in an educational institution, you've got to pick it up by working somewhere. 
So, mm-hmm. so, so uh, Sunil, uh, knowledge so of software me, is right start. next to English. Let me just add to that. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that essential is passion. Okay. If you have the passion, you make the time to learn. You will find the energy to do things. You know, working 18, 20 hours a day is not a problem at Pardon all. Pardon me for uh, so, uh, interrupting you, but if you don't know coding, will passion uh, alone be enough? So what we are doing, incidentally, we run, our family foundation runs many schools. We've made coding compulsory from class three in school. Wonderful. So it becomes one of the languages you learn. Absolutely. It's as much as Hindi or English or, or in any other languages that we are saying this should be a native, to, a native language to everybody, uh, as many young people in India as possible, because this will become a tool for their survival, not just for, for growth, even for survival it will become essential. And I uh, s- uh, sincerely believe that more than some of the maths that is taught in our schools, probably teaching Excel is far more important. Uh, can we get a mic to, uh, to Sanjay here while, on that same question? While you, just while you do that, yeah. uh, I should also tell you, increasingly world over, two parts of education have now increased. One is on family-owned businesses, second is on entrepreneurship. In addition to management, which is around for a long time, these two are now formally being taught across many, many institutions across the globe, including in India. Absolutely. You want me to address what? Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, look, I, 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 no, no, look I, I know the question. I think one of the things is that uh, entrepreneurship, I think, requires a lot of hard work. I think you spoke about passion and experience, but I think also great execution here. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this coding and software technology is one part. I have met two entrepreneurs in the last two days, and you can't imagine, they're nothing to do with coding and technology. One guy makes tire, tires for scooters and tires for big uh, tractors. Amazing business guy, probably going to do 250 crores of EBITDA, and probably the value of his business is going to be over a billion dollars. Okay, there's just tire manufacturing. He's just good at what he does. And I met another guy who's just doing different kinds of asset management businesses and making a massive platform quietly. Nobody's heard about this guy. So I think it's the passion. It's picking a couple of key areas that you really like. Uh, but I think a lot of hard work and good execution, uh, business but, planning but Sanjay, and all that, a, <laughs> they teach us at Ahmedabad, but frankly, it's a lot of execution. Sanjay, in a tech-driven world, what is essential? And one last point, could someone create a hero again in the present time, the way it was done? and as is captured in the book? I think it's tough to replicate exactly that. It's, it's tough. It's not, it's not easy. Not, not easy. So I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens done, in electric it vehicles. Be we'll see. It, yeah, it, it can, can be done, done differently. Yeah. It can be done differently. It would need a different set of uh, uh, tools. It will need a different set of uh, operating practices. Uh, but you're right about there. Ideas are cheap. Yeah. It is about execution. Absolutely, and I think there isn't a better word. But we'll see electric vehicles, right? You will see electric vehicles. Yes. The next hero, whatever, if, if this happens, we'll see who succeeds in electric vehicles. There's so much of money floating around. There's so many people with the same idea. Let's see who does it here. Yeah. You need a supply chain. You need technology. You need all the stuff that they had 50 years ago. Let's see who does this. Absolutely, and execution is the word that I want to uh, leave you all with. You heard from the masters. You heard from people who have really... Uh, build businesses uh, and taught business. Uh, before I hand it over to Professor Vishal Gupta, many thanks uh, to all of you for your views. Vishal. Thank you, Siddharth, and thank you to the panelists. We can take two, two or three questions from the audience. If there are any, any, any questions, anybody? Yes. Yeah, please do introduce yourself briefly and then ask the question. Uh, namaste, I am Harsh. Uh, again, uh, academically, I have done my entrepreneurship, a person from family business and involved in family business. Well, uh, during the lecture series, we understood about a point wherein we have a dilemma about the ownership and the management uh, in the business for the family people who are uh, initially owning the business and then there comes a time wherein we need to decide whether we want to be on the management side of the business or we need to be the ownership side of the business. So I would just like to uh, have some of the key points which would help our family business decide on what are the parameters which needs to be emphasized while deciding on whether we need to be on the management side or we need to be on the ownership side. 
So uh, this is, uh, please sit, please sit. So this is a question which haunts many uh, leaders of family businesses. I think it's also, it's, it's very rare that a family owned businesses trains its next generation to become good owners. We actually just don't train them. We don't provide this and it's possible to do by the way. Uh, running them through a management exposure is a very good idea. So what we did in, in some of our uh, next generation was, I was actually given the charge to, to uh, induct some of them into the, into the companies. So my suggestion to them was first go out and get as good an education as you can. And then if you want to work with us, go out and work somewhere else first. Demonstrate to us that you can work learn all the work ethics at a place where you're not somebody's nephew or niece or cousin or brother. And where if you're asked to come at 8 o'clock in the morning, you will be at office uh, quarter to 8. And if you have to reply to some, some query, you would have replied in the time it was done or you'll get ticked off. And that kind of induction and, and exposure I think is essential to understand the management discipline. You can also not be a good owner if you do not understand management. Yeah, I see a hand there, and then one on the back. Uh, hello, sir. I'm a student at IIM Ahmedabad. So I just had one question. So I think uh, you are in a cyclical business, and there are a lot of downturns. So I just wanted to understand about how the crisis management is done in these situations, and whether there is any change in strategy in a crisis situation, or whether you keep the same strategy and, and go forwards. So this needs about six days to answer, by the way. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, one of the keys, and, and again, this is something we were discussing a little bit earlier. One of the things that COVID has taught all of us is, it's important that no matter what plan you make, what strategy you make, and we used to make you know, a plan with a fallback option, a plan with a contingency, a plan with some cushion in it. but. When this hit, one of the things that we did with all the our investi companies, we said demonstrate to us what is the number of months that you can survive with zero revenue, with 50% revenue, or with 75% revenue. So that's one test. So we did a pressure testing as the RBI asked the banks and NBFC to do. We did that with all of the companies that we deal with. The second was to push them to think about these things. What would it mean? So cyclicality is only one thing. In, in some sense, what you're talking about is adversity and change from your normal healthy operating practices. What happens then? How do you operate? How do you deal with people? What are the decisions you take? Do you, do you scale down people? Do you become more efficient? How do you turn your fixed costs into variable costs? How do you variableize costs? So there is a whole uh, uh, laundry list of things that you need to do. But the one thing you have to learn now is that we have to learn to be flexible and to agree to change our minds when the environment around us changes. Yeah. Last, yeah, we can. Last, one, one uh, Thank you, sir, for, for providing me the opportunity. I am Siddharth, a student of BK School of Management. I want to ask that, uh, you have more resource than this new startup for electric vehicle segment. Then why you are not coming in this? Uh, because there are huge potential and uh, huge, huge demand for this uh, new electric vehicle and all kind of things. So I don't know who you're talking to uh, about, about you are. I, I'm not running the two-wheeler business, so just to clarify. Uh, but I think it's a stated position and I mentioned that there will be no company, no automotive company that will not have a clean energy product. Uh, Hero, I think, has made some announcements already uh, of the products that they would be launching in the coming uh, months itself, not years, but in the coming months. Uh, and I do believe that this work has been going on for a long time. Uh, it's been very thoughtful, very deliberately done. Uh, so my belief is when the products come, they will be uh, good and useful products. Uh, I just want to add one more thing to the comments, points that you had asked earlier. One thing we must all all attempt to do is to enjoy what we do. Because if you don't enjoy what you do, life becomes a punishment. Okay? 
if you start to enjoy the little things that you see every day, then it is very rewarding. Your ability to do more, the ability to be energized to do more is enormous. Uh, otherwise, it's just life is a pain, it's a chore, you don't want to get up and go to work every day. On the flip side, if you're passionate about what you do, long hours is, is a breeze. And, and anything about that you do about that work is enjoyable. So your, your ab ability and capacity to, to do more gets enhanced significantly. It just becomes more fun, enjoyable and rewarding. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful words of, of advice, experience sharing and uh, really encouragement. I would now invite Professor D'Souza to give mementos to our uh, chief guests for the ceremony and also to Mr. Zarabi. Siddharth, please. Thank you for the wonderful discussion and for moderating this uh, panel. Uh, I would now in, like to in, introduce and invite Mr. We can sit on this stage, it's okay. <laughs> Mr. Divyesh Radhya, President AMA, to give the vote of thanks. Let me introduce him. Mr. Radhya is the President of Ahmedabad Management Association. He is the Executive Director of Orset Hydraulics. Honorary Secretary of Gujarat Cancer Society since 2019, Vice President of the Indo-Japan Friendship As Association and Founder and Trustee of a charity to support rural school education for girls. Mr. Radhya, please. Thank you, Vishal. Our distinguished speaker and guest, Sri Sunil Kant Munjal, Sri Sanjay Nair, uh, CEO of KKR India. Uh, I am Director Professor Errol D'Souza, uh, Professor Vishal Gupta, Mr. Siddharth Zarabi, Mr. Piyu Sharma, and other dignitaries from IIM and AMA, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of IIM and AMA, I'm really grateful to Sri Manjal for being with us for today's event under the auspices of the Ashang Desai Center for Leadership and Organizational Development at IIM Ahmedabad. It was such an inspiring and an enriching, you know, address straight from the heart, you know, of a visionary corporate leader and an institution builder. Sri Sunil Manjal was to come to AMA in 2020 to release this very book you are seeing over there but due to the covid and the lockdown you know that had to be you know cancelled or put off that point of time but it's it's a, we are honored that uh, you are in the ama premises today and mr munjal the past president of ima our apex body and it's that's why again i'll say that we are really honored to have you uh, today uh, the hero group it signifies entrepreneurship and self-reliance. You know, these buzzwords, uh, make in India or, uh, you know, Atmanirbhar, you know, they are today, but the Manjal family could do this four decades back. The hero group also is an epitome of excellence in manufacturing and could achieve some great world records, as you saw in that film, as the largest manufacturer of bicycles as well as motorcycles, you know. It's also an epitome of fairness ethics and great excellent I will say people management the hero group of companies have not only contributed generously for CSR or philanthropic causes but they have patronized you know education healthcare fine arts performing arts and so many cultural and community based activities you know once again a very big thanks to Sri Munjal for being here and we are grateful to have, you know, Sanjay Nair and Mr. Siddharth Wabi for their presence. And of course, this event was wonderfully moderated by Siddharth. Uh, I thank uh, IIM 
you know, to host this event with AMA in our campus and also grateful to the press and the electronic media for their coverage today in the press conference also. And I all thank all the invited guests and members of the audience for their presence. It was a wonderful evening. And once again, thank you all and have a great weekend. Thank you.